So, Game of Thrones Season 8, Episode 4. Now, as you guys know, I've been pretty critical of this season so far. I, I said season, Episode 1 and 2 were trash. I said they were boring. They were nothing burger episodes. They were an unnecessary epilogue for the previous season. And they were more build-up when, like, we already have had, like, seven seasons of build-up and all of season seven was build-up so we didn't need another two episodes it just wasted a lot of screen time left that um could have been spent with better things and then episode three i thought was a mess uh, not even just the bad military tactics but the horrible cinematography i couldn't tell what was going on more characters frankly should have died it was just like such an anti-climax like, a lot of people complain about Arya killing the Night King. I actually liked that. I thought that that was kind of a good, like, unexpected twist. And it kind of made the whole faceless men assassin thing pay off. So I, I did really like that. That was a good um, twist. It just was done really, really poorly. The, the whole episode was just kind of a mess. So season eight, episode four, what did I think? I, I actually really liked this episode. I thought this was a massive step in the right direction. True, it's kind of an epilogue for the the kind of a follow-up of the previous episode. And it's getting ready for the finale. But A, this is only one episode. And B, there is a lot to kind of discuss. Because now that the main threat is over, now that the they've, they've defeated the White Walkers, um, that whole thing's over. What they're left with now is trying to pick up the pieces, decide what's the, the new Westerosi order going to be, if you will, once Danny wins or once Cersei wins. Uh, who's going to come out of it in one piece? Who isn't? So near the beginning of this episode, something happened that I've wanted to happen for a very long time. Uh, Daenerys legitimized uh, Gendry, made him Gendry Baratheon, and made him Lord Paramount of the Stormlands. Which I was really happy about because I like it when the, the great houses are able to s sustain themselves and continue on. One of my issues with once, as soon as Gendry becomes Lord Paramount of the Riverlands, he proposes marriage to Arya. He's like, look, Arya, I love you. You can come with me and you can be Lady Paramount of the Stormlands and we can like rule together. And Arya's like, that's not me. And it's an obnoxious thing she says throughout it. She's like, I don't want to be a lady. I don't want to get married. I want to ride around the countryside. I, I don't know, just doing shit. So she goes off with the hound and leaves Gendry there. So Gendry got friend zoned by the hound, I guess. And I just thought it was really lame. I just thought maybe that was going to be Arya's character arc. She's kind of accomplished what she set out to do. I mean, I guess Cersei's still alive, but she killed most of the people on her list. Uh, she also killed the Night King. So I kind of felt it might have been a good time for her to kind of put up her um, her latex mask. But Arya is kind of an insufferable character anyways, so that doesn't really bother me. What we did also saw in this episode that I really liked is we're starting to see Danny become unhinged. Once she found out that Jon was her nephew... And that she was, that he had a better claim to the throne than her. She immediately went through an existential crisis. Because her whole claim to legitimacy now is basically meaningless. I maintain that Bran and Sam just made that whole thing up. There's no way Rhaegar could get a divorce. There was absolutely no grounds to, to divorce El Elia Martell. They were married. Their marriage was consummated. It was not coerced. They even had two children. So, yeah, it's it's not. It's, he's not a legitimate heir. There's no way he could have gotten an annulment. And divorce doesn't exist in this this universe. Um, so once she finds out about it, she just is going through an existential crisis, and we're really starting to see the beginnings of Mad Queen Danny. She's just kind of breaking down. Something else you can see is Danny has like no ability to rule or to lead. Basically, she has a combination of idealism, childish petulance, and she's surrounded by people who basically worship her. That's like a, a really, I think, kind of a big part of her character is she isn't able to have relationships with normal relationships. Either she's surrounded by people who worship her 
or people who want to kill her. It, it kind of reminds me of something that was said of Nero. He had no friends and no enemies. That is, he didn't really have anyone to direct him. Like... And she surrounded herself with people who are frankly incompetent. I don't know what's gone on with Tyrion. Tyrion's become a complete and utter joke. Uh, Varys hasn't done anything in like five seasons. Varys is like one of the most intelligent manipulator f figures in the books. But, well, and even in earlier seasons. But him and Littlefinger just became massive jokes. They had like their 4D chest. 30 year long plan to cure the common cold and they aren't doing anything. But Varys and Tyrion actually did something in this episode. So as Danny increasingly becomes unhinged and, and talks about how she's just going to destroy everything and how she's she's destined to end all tyranny in the world, etc. Um, Varys and, and Tyrion start talking about whether or not they should kill her and replace her with Jon. They're like, you know them both. Who would make a better ruler? And I'm like, neither of them would make a good ruler. John's, in a, John's a very weak man in a lot of ways. He, he, he doesn't have any of the... He doesn't have the education. He doesn't have the temperament to rule. The fact that he doesn't want the throne doesn't make him that good. Also, neither of them is, is Faith of the Seven, which is... The Iron Throne is by conquest, but it's also by divine right that the seven... I mean, Aegon kind of created the myth afterwards that he prayed to the father the day be, the night before he sailed to Westeros um, to give him blessing. And then the, the Septon, uh, the High Septum of the time, welcomed him into Old Town and declared that it was the will of the gods. So you have two people who are both pretty much atheists. Who are going to take over ruling um, a kingdom of a specific religion. So I don't think either of them is technically even eligible for succession. Because most royal houses have a religious component to them. Like in the French royal houses, you have to be Catholic to, to succeed to the throne. I'm not, I don't think the Bonapartists have it. But the Orleanists and the Bourbons both have that as part of their succession requirements. So they're like, so Tyrion continues to go, oh, you can't attack King's Landing. What we should do is we should starve them out. That's a lot more humane. And this is kind of like the criticism a lot of people have of Sun Tzu. Is to win without fighting often kills more people because of the logistics involved and it just prolongs the war. And, and what tends to happen is, particularly in the, the example of China, they just ravage the countryside and the army in discipline just breaks down if you're just doing maneuver warfare. In truth, if Danny was to just take King's Landing, it would end the war and they could start rebuilding. The longer the war goes over on, the longer that there's no effective government in any of the seven kingdoms, the, the more of just a disaster it's going to be. And however many people she kills when taking King's Landing isn't going to amount be nearly as much. I mean, starving them out isn't like a good idea either. That's also going to be a disaster. So they're kind of faced with this, and they're like, if Danny attacks King's Landing, then we're going to, we're going to have to kill her because trying to win a war makes her crazy. So there, there's a cool scene in this episode where Euron ambushes uh, her convoy as they're moving south, and they manage to destroy most of her remaining fleet, as well as kill Rhaegal off. So the ballista, anti-dragon ballistas work and King's Landing has a ton of them. They have like dozens of them on the walls. So her dragon's functionally useless now. Uh, she can't really attack the city with it because it's just going to get shot down. Besides that, her army is massively depleted. They just got, they claim only half of her army died, but like all 100,000 of the Dothraki died. So I, I don't really get how that's a, a thing. But even then, like, her army is in in tatters. She really has very little left. And Cersei has the 20,000 professional soldiers of the Golden Company. Honestly, at this point in time with her mercenary army and the fact that all opposition is dead, if Cersei was able to win at the, um, is able to defeat Danny, she, she might actually be able to 
hold the kingdoms together for a while because all the great houses are basically extinct at this point. So she can just appoint, she can do basically what she was doing and get someone like the Tarleys or some other prestigious family and promote them and have them be personally loyal to her. There's all kinds of other uh, houses like minor houses that have gone extinct and they could also, she could just uh, appoint also her people to all of those. So I think she does actually have a chance of surviving at least a little while if she was to win this war. On the other hand, if Danny wins this war, like, what's she going to do? She has no idea anything about Westeros, like, at all. She she comes with this massive foreign army. I don't, like, get how they're even going to, like, attack a wall. They have Unsullied, who aren't really, who are suited to open field combat, but hoplites aren't really designed to, to assault walls. Also, Dothraki can't do shit against a wall. They'd have to dismount, and they don't wear armor, so they'd be useless. I guess the remaining northern soldiers in the Knights of the Vale would be good, but once again, the Lannisters have ballistas, and lots and lots of archers, and lots and lots of professional soldiers who presumably have decent armor. So at this point, any battle is decisively in the Lannisters' favor. So the, probably the best way Danny could win at this point is to just starve them out. Which would be really horrific, but I, I really don't see what options she has left. The, uh, to do that until um, she riots, until the, the people riot and overthrow her. But Cersei's really not in a bad position at this point in time as we, we're heading into the end. There's a scene where Tyrion tries to parlay with her. And I think it's the most unrealistic part of this episode. Uh, because Cersei goes... because So Dan Danny and like her posse go up to the gate and they send out Kyburn to uh, bargain with them. And... Cersei, for whatever reason, decides to not kill them, to not just shoot them with ballistas while they're having the tr the meeting. I don't get why she didn't do it, because she has no honor. Nobody likes her. I don't think it would... I don't think one more betrayal would really be that bad. She could have easily won the war there, and the fact that she didn't is either that she's more arrogant than I think she was, or the fact that she... Um, is just uh, or just bad writing. I, I tend towards the latter, and then they execute Missandei. So the other thing that happened in this episode is so the wildlings went back north of the wall. So that's cool. I I, I like that. Um, so they they aren't gonna just invade and keep ravaging the um the north. And Jamie and Brienne finally got together because Brienne revealed that she was a virgin and Jamie awkwardly seduced her. So they, they started sleeping together. And it was really awkward. I kept yelling at the screen, marry her, you degenerate, marry her. But um, I don't know. They didn't, it didn't happen on, stream, on screen. So near the end of the episode, Brienne... Oh, sorry, Jamie left to go to King's Landing saying that he was going to go save Cersei. I think he just did that to, um, because he thought that breaking Brienne's heart was less bad than if she went with him when, when he went south, I guess. I think he's going to go there and kill Cersei is, is my belief as to what's, what's, what's going to happen. Because keep in mind, there's the prophecy that her younger brother would kill her. And she thought it was Tyrion, but she was technically born first. So Jaime is also her younger brother. So I think Jaime's going to kill her. Also, Jaime is the Kingslayer. Uh, Bran abdicates as Lord of Winterfell in this episode. So Sansa is basically, I think, Lord Lady Paramount of the North now. So she's going to have to get married and have children at some point in time. I, I don't know when or with who. Um, there was kind of a scene between her and the Hound that wasn't a bad scene. Arya went off with the Hound again because she doesn't want to marry Gendry and have a happy ending because that's not her. Uh, they sent Ghost north of the Wall, which makes no sense. 
because John said, oh, he doesn't belong in the South. And just because they're too lazy to animate him. If you notice, like, Ghost has barely been in the show for, like, the last... Like, since season one, he barely showed up at all. So, overall, though, I think it was a really solid episode. We had a decent little battle scene. We had some really interesting kind of... We're really starting to see the crack show up in Danny. Her kind of messianic thing is, is kind of falling apart a bit. And we're, we're seeing kind of, I think, a really good setup for the end of our little drama. So I like the episode. I'm really looking forward to the last two now. I wasn't, but now I am. Good episode. Um, let's let's.